taking you on a uh, quick 10 minute little stop tour of the history of diabetes. Um, as a quick kind of warning, this topic can be a little bit sensitive, so if anyone at any point does like, uh, would like to leave, you're more than welcome to do so. So in recent history, we have discovered many different types of diabetes. The two most recognisable are type 1, which is a chronic condition where the pancreas produces little or no insulin, and type 2, where an individual has insulin, but it either doesn't work properly or the pancreas can't make enough of it. These two types are typically treated differently, with the type 1 focus being supplementing the body with the insulin it's missing, and type 2 partaking in measures to encourage the body's insulin production and quality. There are other forms of diabetes though that aren't usually acknowledged, like gestational diabetes, type 3C, mature onset diabetes of the young, and latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. It's important for us to be aware of all these different types when looking back at the past, as all these types existed long before they were ever officially discovered. The further back you go, the less understanding there was about the condition and its different forms and nuances. Some of the first mentions of diabetes comes from the two oldest known medical texts. Please excuse my pronunciations throughout this presentation. Um, there's a lot of words that are a bit tricky for me. So the first um, two texts were the Shushruta and Sharaka Samhita. These were ancient Sanskrit texts written by Hindu physicians in India in the first, feel free to sit down, don't worry, in the first millennium BCE. And they were called the condition, um, they called that condition Madhumaha, meaning honey wine. The descriptions and symptoms are very recognizable with unexplained fatigue and weight loss, dryness in the mouth, extreme thirst, and an increased frequency of urination with a pale and sweet urine. To put into context, Diabetes UK launched their four T's Thirst Tired Toilet Thinner campaign in 2012 that identify these exact same symptoms as the main ones to look out for. In ancient India, the diagnosis was made by tasting a patient's urine or noting where the ants congregated around it. The sweetness of diabetic urine was later emphasized further by the Chinese physician uh, Zhang Zhongjin in the second and third centuries. The disease was said to be the most common in people who were gluttonous and indulged in sweet and fatty foods. Physical exercise and liberal quantities of vegetables were prescribed to treat the condition. The word diabetes was first used by Arateus of Cappadocia in the second century. The, word, the term means to run through a siphon in ancient Greek and refers to the large increase in urine production. Arateus said that the condition was fortunately a rare disease, but still wrote extensively on it, where he called diabetes a wonderful affection involving the melting down of flesh and limbs into urine. That sounds delightful. <coughs> he emphasizes in his text the excessive drinking and urination of his patients, but also the nausea, restlessness, and quickness of death in some cases. He prescribed milk, cereals, starch, autumn fruits, sweet wines, as well as bloodletting, cupping, and purgation. One of the first to acknowledge the possibility of more than one type of diabetes was Ivan Sina in the 8th and 9th centuries. He referred to diabetes as water real, highlighting once again the excess urination as a significant symptom. He differentiated this primary type to a secondary one that would have been a result of another kind of disease or further complications of a different condition. Ivan Sina gave a comprehensive list of symptoms, like the ones I've mentioned before, but also listed sexual dysfunction, mental illness, boils, and gangrene. He treated these symptoms with substances that induced vomiting and recommended horseback riding, lukewarm baths, and fragrant wine. I'm not too sure how well these would have gone, but his work was influential for centuries to come, and he was very often kind of quoted in other texts. By the 13th century, the symptoms of diabetes had become well established and recognized, even if it wasn't a very common condition. The ways the condition was diagnosed, however, began to vary. In the ancient period, diabetes was diagnosed with tasting urine or by seeing if there was any sweetness that attracted animals or bugs. This method had mostly fallen out by the 13th century, and Gilbertus Anglicus's approach is perhaps one of my favorites that I have researched, and I'll just read out what he wrote in his Compendium of Medicine. It is in Middle English, but I'll try to... It, it is pretty good, like, recognizable. So, Receive urine of him that is sick, and cast it on a red nettle at once, when he hath pissed. Come again at the morrow, and if the nettle be not dead, it is a token of life. If it be dead, he shall die. <laughs> Gilbert has made no mention of how he would actually treat diabetes, and it was likely that if the patient looked to live, they didn't need the treatment anyway, 
and if they were likely to die, then treatment would be of no help, so they would not be given any. This type of urine inspection and diabetes diagnosis, however, was ridiculed later on, and this is quite a name, by Ariolus Theophratus Bombastus von Hohenheim, uh, but luckily he was also known by the name Paraclesis, which is far easier to pronounce. This was in the 15th century, and he was one of the first to insist on analysing urine chemically by distillation and other methods. He evaporated the urine of a diabetic patient and obtained a white residue that he mistook for salt when it was actually sugar. This became a leading way of diagnosis in Switzerland. Treatment also continued to vary uh, throughout the world. So you've got Domitus Antonius Altamari in Italy who tried to cure diabetes with sulfur baths, and Amatus and Zacatus Lusitanus, no relation, in the 16th century who argued that diabetes was caused by an excess of food, sex and alcohol, so their cure was to intermittently purge patients of all three and purge, uh, uh, preach morality. Thomas Willis in the 17th century was one of the first to make the clear distinction between what is now known as diabetes mellitus, an umbrella term for diabetes today, and diabetes insipidus, a completely separate condition that involves excessive thirst and urination, but is not related in any way to glucose or insulin. He reinstated taste in urine as a form of diagnosis and emphasized the sweetness of diabetic urine, but he never uh, considered that it did actually contain sugar he wrote extensively on the condition and he referred to diabetes as the pissing evil. At the same time as Willis, a Scottish ex-military surgeon named John Rollo became a consultant to patients of diabetes and one of the leading names in diabetic diagnosis and treatment. He popularised the term diabetes mellitus to differentiate it from standalone symptoms and was one of the first to actively associate cataracts with diabetes. He utilised a urine glucose test developed by Matthew Dobson and he wrote about increased sugar in the blood and proposed a protein-rich, low-carb, mostly meat diet that was said to be extremely effective in levelling blood sugar levels. Although I'm not too sure if the opium he also recommended would have had an impact at all. The 19th and 20th centuries were an extremely important period for medicine across the board and saw the discovery of diabetes as a hormone deficiency disease. This incited a whole range of different forms of treatments and many cure proclamations, so one recommended cure was mixing uranium nitrate and old Bordeaux wine, which apparently would cure both diabetes and obesity, but only if given at an early enough stage. How you know how early it could be? No clue. The fifth edition of the US National Dispensatory in 1894 listed no less than 42 cures for diabetes, but evidently none were successful. One of the most popular forms of treatment, however, was the starvation diet. This was begun by French physician Apollinaire Richardard, who noticed that starvation in diabetics during the Franco-Prussian War reduced glucose in the blood and other symptoms. In his book, he advised patients to eat as little as possible, and this treatment was popularised by the American Frederick Madison Allen in 1912, who had a worldwide reputation and recommended several days of starvation followed by a diet of undernourishment. Not everyone agreed with this treatment though, and some suggested other diets, similar to John Rollo's, the high protein, but others did try um, the diet of high carbohydrate, high sugar, because they thought it would cancel things out, and understandably, that did not work in any way. Overall, however, the starvation diet did remain a main form of treatment for many until the discovery of the hormone insulin in 1921, by Frederick G. Banting, Charles H. Best, and J.J. R. McLeod at the University of Toronto. They isolated material from pancreases of dogs and used it to keep diabetic dogs alive. And in 1922, they gave the first injections to a 14-year-old boy and almost immediately his blood sugar levels began to fall. In 1923, James B. Collett pu uh, purified the pancreatic extracts to reduce the side effects from treatment. In the same year, Banting, Collett and Best were awarded US patents on insulin and they sold the patents to the University of Toronto for one year each. <coughs> Banting said that insulin did not belong to him, it belonged to the world, and wanted it to be accessible to anyone who needed it. And from, 19, from October 1923, insulin began to be produced on a mass scale. In 1934, the Diabetic Association, now Diabetes UK, was set up by H.G. Wells and Dr. R.D. Lawrence to improve British access to insulin. Overall, worldwide research in the 1940s and 50s led to insulin syringes and new urine testing methods. The 1960s saw glucose testing strips and the discovery of a purer insulin with less adverse side effects. 
in the 1970s witnessed newer portable insulin pumps and glucose meters, as well as the first biosynthetic human insulin. Insulin pens were invented in the late 1980s, and from the early 1990s, there were new medications for type 2 diabetics, such as metformin. <coughs> Research into causes, treatment, monitoring, and a possible cure continues through to today. But before I end this talk, I would like to discuss how the discovery of insulin and the increase of research um, has impacted St. John Ambulance. Initially, when going through our first aid journals, there is very little mention of diabetes. Between 1901 and 1917, so 16 years, I found just four mentions of the condition, with one being a notice of death and the others being a secondary mention under a different symptom. The first mention of insulin was in 1926 to 1928, so several years after it was um, kind of discovered and started being produced. And it was only mentioned how to minimize infection bruises and nothing about the insulin itself. The 1945 to 1946 first aid journal is the first hint we have of someone recognizing that more work needed to be done. And Sir Henry Martin wrote an article stating that the subject of diabetes received no reference whatsoever in standard textbooks and there was no instruction given to those practicing first aid. It wasn't until 1954, however, that things notably began to change. The 1954 First Aid Journal, which I have on the table that you can look at just after the talk, provided to its readers for the first known time on how to provide first aid to an unconscious diabetic. And in the same year, also in the journal, it lists the annual Sussex Open First Aid Competition, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, for the, um, that includes a diabetic for the no, first known time in the scenario provided to competitors. I won't read out the whole scenario, but you're welcome to read it yourself afterwards. Uh, but to paraphrase, Bill, a diabetic, had taken his usual insulin in the morning before leaving home, but was delayed in eating his sandwiches as Mary, the trolley girl, had collided with a heavy lamp, injuring both herself and a man called John. While Mary and John were notably injured, Bill collapses from insulin shock unknown to people around him and competitors were tasked with diagnosing all 18 of the differing casualties between the three. Today, you'll find a whole section in our first aid manuals on how to provide first aid care to those with diabetes, mostly in reference to hypoglycemia. And the same is included in St. John Abbott's first aid courses too. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I have some more printouts that you're welcome to look at over here. And if you have any questions, I'll be available for the next 10 minutes to answer. Thank you very much.